So this is a video that I have also had prepared for quite some time, but I hadn't yet gotten around to record it. So people kept pointing out that I haven't really done Seeker Cell on my channel. So I decided, oh, let me just record this video. So let's talk about Seeker Cell disease or Seeker Cell anemia. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is here on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at sickle cell disease and sickle cell anemia. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to receive your notifications of such amazing content every time I post. So before we actually go any further, I just want to debunk five myths that people actually have about sickle cell that probably some of you that are watching the video may even have. So the first myth is about pain. Really the biggest myth is that all patients are drug addicts. Remember that the hallmark of sickle cell disease is you have this severe unpredictable pain that's going to be requiring high doses of narcotics in some instances. So don't think of these sicklers that are coming to the hospital in pain as people that are drug addicts or wanting to get some narcotics. Um, that's not really the case. So please treat them with kind. And the, the second myth is that the patients don't actually live past the age of 21, which is not true. I have a lot of patients that have gone past this age. The vast majority of them can actually live well into uh, the adulthood. Then the other myth is that the sickle cell trait is a mild form of sickle cell disease. The fact is that these are going to be considered as asymptomatic carriers. If, for example, both parents are carriers of the trait, then there's one in four a chance, there's a 25 chance that they may be born with a baby that has sickle cell. So it's very important to actually get tested to find out if you're a carrier. And remember, one out of 12 African Americans have sickle cell trait and they may not even know that they have it. And of course, the other myth is that sickle cell disease only affects black people. That's not true. Remember that sickle cell disease affects one in every 600 African American but it can also be seen in people of other races. Then the last myth that may actually surprise some of you is that the stem cell or bone marrow transplant is actually a universal cure. Remember that very few patients are actually eligible to having a stem cell transplant. Moreover, you have to find a donor that is compatible and a lot of log logistics. So most patients actually are not going to even qualify for a stem cell transplant. And these are transplants are only done in specific areas in the world. So before I go in any further, mm -hmm. I just want us to discuss about hemoglobin because it's very important to understand the different types of or different variants of hemoglobin, both normal and abnormal variants of hemoglobin before we actually dive into talking about Cell. So remember that inside your blood, you have these small cells, which are known as red blood cells or erythrocytes. These are going to be responsible for carrying oxygen from the respiratory system to the tissues and also carbon dioxide from the tissues to the respiratory system. Now, to aid in this function of carrying oxygen, there is a protein that is found on the inside that is known as hemoglobin. So remember this hemoglobin in normal instances can be found in three main variants. So you have what is known as hemoglobin A or adult hemoglobin, which is going to be the most common type of hemoglobin in adults, and is going to be made up predominantly of four chains, two alpha chains and two beta chains. This is very important for you to remember. Remember that hemoglobin A or adult hemoglobin is going to be responsible for carrying about 95% of oxygen in the blood. Then we have our hemoglobin A2, which is a minor form of hemoglobin in adults. It's going to be made up of two alpha chains and two delta chains. And this is going to be accounting for roughly about two to 3% of the hemoglobin in the bloodstream of an individual. Then the last important variant that I want you to remember, that's a normal variant of hemoglobin, is hemoglobin F or fetal hemoglobin. Remember that this is going to be the main type of hemoglobin that fetuses and newborn are going to be having. It's going to be predominantly consisting of two alpha chains and two gamma chains. Notice how the adult hemoglobin and the adult hemoglobin 2 have uh, the two alpha and two beta as well as two alpha and two delta respectively. 
but with the fetal hemoglobin, you have two alpha and two gamma chains. This is very important because fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity of oxygen than adult hemoglobin. So this is going to be ensuring that the fetus is getting enough oxygen as possible. Because remember that the uterus is a relatively hypoxic environment. But when this child is born, they're born into a lot of this oxygen. They don't need this fetal hemoglobin. So the, there is a gradual change from fetal hemoglobin being replaced to adult hemoglobin. Now remember, you're now coming from a hemoglobin protein that has two alpha and two gamma chains to now a hemoglobin molecule that has two alpha and two beta chains. So this is why certain diseases will only manifest at a certain age. And this transition usually happens right after birth, but reaches its peak roughly at around five to six months keep this point in mind. Then in terms of the abnormal hemoglobin variants, we have hemoglobin S, which is the abnormal form that we find in sickle cell disease. It's made up of two alpha chains and two beta chains, but there is a mutation that is going to be affecting the beta chains. We will talk about this mutation in much detail very shortly. We also have the hemoglobin C, which is another abnormal form of hemoglobin. Here, you also have two alpha chains and two beta chains but the beta globin chain has a different mutation than the one that we see in sickle cell disease. So these patients that have hemoglobin C don't necessarily have sickle cell disease, but they may have milder forms of anemia. Sometimes this HBC can combine with, a, a, you can find instances where you have it with a patient that has a sickle cell, the HBS, and you call these as combined heterozygosity for those that have sickle cell disease. Then... HBE is another abnormal form of hemoglobin. It's predominantly found in people in Southeast Asia, and it's made up of two alpha chains and two beta chains. Again, the beta chain has a different mutation, but it's different from the one that causes hemoglobin C. It's different from the one that causes hemoglobin S. And remember that HBE also does not cause sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia, but is a cause of mild forms of anemia if it's inherited from both parents. Remember also with hemoglobin C, it doesn't cause sickle cell disease, but it can be present in patients that have sickle cell disease. I think that's one point that I've mentioned in the, as I was introducing the second point that may confuse a, a lot of you guys. So I thought I'll just clarify that. Then hemoglobin H is a rare form of this hemoglobin that's going to be caused by deletion of a portion of the beta globin gene. And this is going to be causing severe forms of anemia and it can actually be fatal. This is actually seen in thalassemias. Then we have hemoglobin M, which is another rare form of hemoglobin that is caused by a mutation in the alpha chain, the alpha globin, globin chain. And remember that this is going to resulting in mild forms of anemia. So let's talk about sickle cell anemia and sickle cell disease. So remember that this is going to be an autosomal recessive disorder that's going to be characterized by a substitution of amino acids. Remember where we're coming from. Here we're talking about hemoglobin specifically adult hemoglobin, which has two alpha chains and two beta chains. Now, the problem here in a patient that has sickle cell, whether sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia, is that there is a substitution that is affecting the beta chain. So what happens on the beta chain? At the sixth position, you have a specific amino acid. The sixth position is found on the surface of this hemoglobin and actually helps in maintaining the structure of hemoglobin. So an, an amino acid that is normally found there is glutamic acid or glutamate. And remember that glutamic acid is a negatively charged hydrophilic amino acid, meaning it loves water. It will maintain the, the shape of the hemoglobin because there's water on the inside of the red blood cells. Now, what happens is that when there is this mutation that is happening, you're going to be substituting the glutamic acid and you're going to be replacing it with valine, which is a neutral hydrophobic acid. So once this has happened, this now will cause a conformational change in the structure of hemoglobin and therefore may predispose the cell or the hemoglobin to sickle up or to precipitate, to polymerize, and it may cause ultimately the red blood cells to sickle up. Now, remember that this disorder is going to be as a result of a point mutation. You have certain nucleotides being changed in the DNA. Instead of you having the guanosine, adenine guanosine um, triple base, you're going to be having the guanosine uh, thymidine uh, guanosine uh, type of uh, codon. So you have adenine being changed to um, being, being changed to T, the uh, thymidine. Then remember that this is happening on chromosome 11. 
at the short arm position 15.5. Very important for you to remember. Now, why is this all this? Why am I mentioning all this? And why is all this important? Remember, all this is happening on the beta chain. All this is happening on the sixth position of the beta globulin chain. And this is happening as a result of a point mutation that was happening on chromosome 11. Now, when this has happened and you have this substitution of the glutamic acid and the valine, this is now going to be leading to the deoxygenated variant of that hemoglobin being a hydrophobic or this having these hydrophobic interactions with the adjacent amino acid. And this is going to be causing now the hemoglobin S molecules to aggregate and create these large polymers. And this ultimately will lead to sickling up of the red blood cells. Remember that this sickling of the red blood cells are going to be making them less deformable and is going to be predisposing them to obstructing the microcirculation resulting in tissue hypoxia, which is going to be further promoting sickling. These red blood cells also are going to be rapidly hemolyzed and have a very short lifespan of about 10 to 20 days. The usual onset of the disease is roughly around five to six months. And this makes sense because you have fetal hemoglobin that doesn't have a beta chain to be affected, which has two alpha chains and two gamma chains. So as the concentration now changes from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin, which is roughly peaks at around five to six months, then you get this manifestation of this condition. Remember that depending on the type of hemoglobin chain combination, we have three main clinical syndromes that you can actually think about. Well, what is known as sickle cell trait, or what is known as sickle cell disease, and well, what is known as sickle cell anemia. So in terms of sickle cell trait, here they have one normal hemoglobin uh, gene, adult hemoglobin gene, and they have and they are carrier of a sickle cell gene. So remember that these ones are going to be asymptomatic. You don't think of this as the mild form of the disease, but they are asymptomatic. They can be symptomatic and they may develop symptoms under certain circumstances. For example, if they are subjected to hypoxia, if they're subjected to high altitudes. Remember, these individuals have about 50 to 60% of adult hemoglobin and about 35 to 45% of uh, the sickle cell hemoglobin, and they'll have a small percentage of the fetal hemoglobin. The parents are usually asymptomatic without anemia unless if they are exposed to severe hypoxia. This would be in the background of, this can happen if a sickler who has both sickle cell genes marries a normal individual, that means all their children will have, will be carriers, or it can happen if two carriers marry each other where some of their children can be carriers and others will have the sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia rather. Then you have some Patients that have um, inability to concentrate urine, we call that as isosthenoyuria, or they may develop hematuria, that's blood in the urine in about 5% of the cases during adolescence in those that have sickle cell trait. Then remember that these carriers are protected against Plasmodium falciparum. They're not going to be protected against the other forms of malaria, which is why we do put these individuals or individuals that have sickle cell on malaria prophylaxis, because even as, in as much as they may have some protection against Plasmodium falciparum, they are still susceptible to other forms of malaria, which can be lethal because already they have a small pool of red blood cells in their system. Then the second type is known as sickle cell disease, which is referred to as combined heterozygosity. Sickle cell trait is just called heterozygosity. Then sickle cell disease is combined heterozygosity. So here, individuals have an abnormal sickle cell gene, and they have another abnormal hemoglobin gene, which is not necessarily a sickle cell gene. It could be a hemoglobin C. Remember about those other abnormal sickle cell variants, that, uh, rather abnormal hemoglobin variants that I talked about on the third slide. So remember that these ones are going to have these intermediate symptoms. Then we have sickle cell anemia, which is known as a homozygous state, where they have both sickle cell genes. This is the most severe form of the disease. Here they're going to have these two abnormal sickle cell genes, and these ones are not going to be protected against malaria, and they're going to be having these characteristic symptoms of sickle cell. Now what exactly is the pathogenesis of the condition? Remember that the hemoglobin S is going to maintain its normal function as long as you have a lot of oxygen present. So in the lungs, or at areas where there's a high oxygen tension, there's not going to be much of a problem because it's oxygenated. The problem comes where you reach 
areas where there is little amounts or low oxygen tension, such as the tissues. So when the deoxygenation actually happens and this molecule actually loses its oxygen to the tissues or it's in an area where there is hypoxia, then this is going to be causing them to become insoluble and it's going to cause them to polymerize. Therefore, therefore this is going to be increasing the viscosity of the blood. Remember that the polymers are going to form a gel-like substance which contains crystals that are known as tactoids. And the flexibility of these cells as they're cycling up uh, decreases and they become rigid and they take up their characteristic appearance, they look like a sequel. I'll show you a, a picture of uh, peripheral smear that actually shows these uh, sequel cell red blood cells. And remember that this process initially is going to be reversible, but as this is repetitively happening, this is going to be causing them to lose their membrane flexibility and eventually they'll become irreversibly sequeled. And this is because it may be triggered by dehydration, partly because you have this potassium that's going to be leaving the red blood cells via a special channel, which is known as the GADOS channel. This is known as a calcium activated potassium channel. And remember when I said these irreversibly sequel cell uh, cells may remain irreversibly sequeled and they're going to be dehydrated, they're going to be dense and they'll not even return for normal um, they don't be able to return to normal after oxygen has been supplied. They also are going to be easily able to actually stick to the endothelium of many uh, microvasculatures such that it can actually shorten the red cell survival. It may shorten the lifespan to about 10 to 20 days. It may lead to impaired passage through microcirculation leading to obstruction of the small vessels and even tissue infarction. We'll talk about the different manifestations that you can have as a result of this. It may also lead to a crisis. And a very important thing to remember is that sometimes crises have triggers. But in the majority of the cases, there will not be any precipitating factor that you can actually identify. But in some cases, you may identify a precipitating factor. You may also get adhesion proteins being activated um, on the endothelial cells, such as the vascular cellular adhesion molecule 1 or the VCAM1, that may actually play a role in, particularly in vaso occlusion, when the rigid cells are actually trapped, and it may also even further facilitate polymerization of the cells. Remember that the sequel cell hemoglobin releases its oxygen to the tissues more readily than the normal hemoglobin because it has less affinity. So even if a patient may have a very low HB, they tend to compensate very well for being anemic because that sequel cell um, hemoglobin will release that oxygen easily when it reaches the tissue sites where it's hypoxic, especially, uh, except there is a, an exception to this. It's a, a bit different when there's a crisis or there's a complication because those sequel cell red blood cells may not even get to the tissue sites in the first place. Now, what are some of the precipitating factors you need to be worried about? You may have hypoxia, you may have dehydration, you may have a, a cold, uh, that's cold weather, you may have acidosis, you may have uh, infection or fever. This is very important. Always look for an infection when you get a sick lie that's coming in with a crisis. And you may also have living at high altitude. Now, what are the clinical features that you tend to expect in this patient? So they may present in many different ways. So one way in which those patients could present is that they could present as a crisis, which is what we will discuss a lot in detail. They may present as due to a complication, which I will mention to you towards the end of this lecture. They may also be just discovered incidentally where they are being treated for something else. They go to the hospital for something else. There is some suspicion that they may be a sickler, then you discover that they have sequel I remember during my clinical rotation, uh, when I was still in obstetrics, we had a patient actually that came in and this patient had um, an HB of about six, seven. So we were, we gave her the iron sucrose because at that moment in time, we didn't know that this patient had sequel cell. We gave her uh, iron sucrose. This woman was about like 21 years. Gave her the iron sucrose, gave her the folic acid because we didn't have blood in our blood bank at that particular moment and waited for a blood transfusion. So the consultant just said, anyways, let's order for a, sick, a sickling test because you may never know. That's how we did a sickling test. Indeed, it came out positive, and that's how we ordered for HB electrophoresis. It was actually quite incidental to discover at an age of 21 years that someone has sequel cell. So 
what are some of the things that you may present with? Remember that when you re use the term crisis, this generally means that something that has occurred suddenly. So these clinical features occur suddenly and they may be divided as a sequestrative crisis or sequestration crisis. You may have a hyperhemolytic crisis. You may have an aplastic crisis. You may have a vasoclusive crisis. So you can remember the acronym SHAVE. And of course, you may have a mixed where you have these different crises presenting together. Then remember that even though you may have infections, dehydration, acidosis, cold temperature, exercise, extremes of emotions, very happy and very sad emotions acting as triggers, then in most of the cases you don't have an identifiable precipitating cause. Let's begin with our vasoocclusive crisis, which is the most important and the most common type of crisis that patients are actually going to be presenting with. This is going to be occurring when you have this obstruction of the microcirculation by these sequel cell red blood cells that is going to be resulting in this ischemic injury. Remember that the major complaint that you have in these patients is pain. You may have these bony pains that they may be experiencing in the femur, they may be experiencing in the tibia, they may be experiencing in the lower vertebra. So they'll have these recurrent bony pains. That's one important thing to actually note in your history, someone coming in with recurrent bony pains. So typically, this is going to be described as this deep gnawing or throbbing like pain that lasts about three to seven days. In young children, it can affect the extremities. However, in the older patients, it tends to affect the head, it can affect the chest, it can affect the abdomen, it can even affect the back. And the pain is often recurrent. That's one important thing to actually pick out on your history. Some triggers of a vasoclusive crisis are going to be including hypoxemia, which may cause or it may be due to an acute chest syndrome or it may be due to other respiratory complications. It may be due to dehydration. Remember, acidosis is going to be causing a shift in the oxygen dissociation curve. It may also be due to changes in the body temperature, such as a fever. Now, what are the different presentations that patients that have a vasoclusive crisis can actually come in with? One of the most and earliest features that you may actually see is what is known as the acute dactylitis or the hand and foot syndrome. So here they'll have this painful symmetric swelling of the digits, the hands and the feet, which is going to be due to this ischemic type of necrosis of the small bones of the hands. And it's also thought to be due to rapidly expanding bone marrow as a result of the choking of the blood supply to that bone. One differential diagnosis to keep in mind is osteomyelitis. This is exactly how the uh, condition actually presents very common in infants. It's actually the most common type of presentation in infants. And this is a very common question on your OSCE stations in pediatrics. And then you may also have an acute abdomen where you have this abdominal pain, this distension that's going to be often causing sickling with the mesenteric artery. This may actually be confused with surgical conditions like intestinal obstruction, and you may actually even open up the patient. Meanwhile, it's just simply a vasoclusive crisis. Differential diagnosis includes things like cholecystitis, appendicitis, and even splenic sequestration. Now, in terms of the vasoclusive crisis, they may sometimes block blood vessels in certain areas. So if they block blood vessels in certain areas, you may have infarction and the different characteristic presentations that you may get. In the central nervous system, you may have a cerebrovascular accident or a stroke. Remember, patients may present with dysarthria, hemiplegia, and they may be asymptomatic. If you get a very young individual presenting with stroke-like symptoms, you must think either rheumatic heart disease or you must think sickle cell uh, disease or sickle cell anemia because it's not so common for patients that are very young to present with a stroke. Then you may also have retinal hemorrhages. You may have pulmonary infarcts and acute chest syndrome, which may be in the background of a pneumonitis or a fat emboli. You may have an autoinfarction of the spleen and autosplenectomy. This is very important. Remember, by the age of six years, somewhere there, it's not the spleen is going to be not usually palpable because it, it actually goes undergoes autosplenectomy. Remember, the spleen is very important because not only does it function in the hematological system in the control and the breakdown of red blood cells, it also functions in the immunological system. Because if you lose a spleen, it means it increases the susceptibility to infection by encapsulated organisms. So things like pneumococcus, which is why we offer vaccines for them, and Haemophilus influenza. So this is as a result of a reduction in the serum opsonins that are present that predisposes you to infections with encapsulated organisms. Then you may have kidney involvement where you have papillary necrosis that's leading to inability to concentrate urine, which is a term that is referred to as isosthenuria. 
You may also have uh, it affecting the bone and the bone marrow, leading to osteomyelitis. Remember, osteomyelitis generally is commonly caused by uh, Staphylococcus aureus, but specifically in patients that have sickle cell disease, you must look for salmonella. So salmonella is one important cause to actually look for. You may also have a vascular necrosis of the head of the uh, femur. You may have a vascular necrosis of the head of the humerus. You may sometimes have priapism, which is characterized, what I like to say, the P's of priapism. So you have a persistent, painful, purposeless, prolonged penile erections. Five P's. Persistent, purposeless, painful, prolonged penile erection. So this also should always be considered in a patient that actually presents with priapism to the hospital. Now, I want to just digress a little bit and talk about one of the very important types of vasoocclusive crisis that happens in the chest. So remember, there's a type of vasoocclusive crisis happening in the lungs, and it's going to be presenting with chest pain, cough, tachypnea, dyspnea, hypoxemia, hypotension. You may have fever. Sometimes you may have some x-ray findings like a new pulmonary infiltrate. And to give me some feedback if you're actually following with this lecture, I just want you guys to comment in the section below how clinically you would distinguish between an acute chest syndrome and a pneumonia. What things would you look for clinically to help you distinguish between an acute chest syndrome and a pneumonia? Because as you can see, clinical features are very similar. Remember the causes include infections like viral mycoplasma, uh, mycoplasma pneumonia rather, viral infections, you may have chlamydia pneumonia, you may have streptococcus pneumonia. Very important, Mycoplasma and chlamydia are atypical bacteria. So remember, whenever you're suspecting an acute chest syndrome, you also want to target these atypical organisms. How do we do this? We add a macrolide to the regimen, a drug like azithromycin. Remember also that sickling, atelectasis, a fat embolism, a painful bone crisis affecting the ribs and even pulmonary edema from fluid overload can lead to an acute chest syndrome. Here's a one pathogenesis that uh, I've depicted on the right of your screen. Remember you have a vasoclusion that's going to be happening that's going to be increasing the polymerization and the erythrocyte rigidity right here at the top. Then you may also have the microvasculature being occluded in the bone marrow. You may have some bone marrow influx, influx rather. Then you may have a secretion of the phospholipase, you, this may also further lead to pulmonary or rather may be associated with pulmonary infection. And remember, all this is going to be pointing you towards or leading towards acute chest syndrome. Whenever you have this vasoclusive crisis, an increase in polymerization of the erythrocytes as well as erythrocyte rigidity, remember that the endothelium uh, expresses the vascular cellular adhesion molecule 1. And this increases the adhesion of these red blood cells to the endothelium. Remember that this increase of the um, the increased erythrocyte adhesion in the lungs can actually cause pulmonary infarction. And whenever you have this pulmonary infarction and you get areas of hyperventilation and atelectasis resulting from a rib infarct or maybe a vertebral infarct, this is going to be leading to shunting of blood in the lungs. And remember, this may lead to the decrease in oxygen delivery and the desaturation of the hemoglobin, and this may cause regional hypoxia. So this is the vicious cycle that is often created in acute chest syndrome. Then we'll move on to the next type of crisis, which is a sequestration crisis. So here this is due to the sequel cells actually blocking the outflow of the spleen, such that you have this uh, pooling of the peripheral blood in the spleen. It may lead to engorgement of the spleen. So this would be in the background of an exam question that they ask you where a child presents with this abdominal distension and they are in shock. So a child presenting with abdominal distension and they're in shock, you must keep splenic sequestration as a differential in your mind. Then less common, commonly it may also occur in the liver. It may occur in patients that are less than the age of six. And remember, patients are going to be presenting with abdominal distension, abdominal pain, shortness of breath, tachycardia. You may have pala, you may have fatigue, and you may have a shock or circulatory collapse. The exact reason as to why this happens is largely unknown, though it may be associated with a febrile illness. Mortality rates of a splenic sequestration is very high, so you must be able to pick this up clinically. So labs are going to be revealing reticulocytosis and there's going to be severe hemolysis, there's going to be rapid splenomegaly and a high reticulocyte count that may, uh, you may see on your laboratory investigations. Remember that splenectomy is recommended but some, um, practitioner, by some practitioners because the recurrence is up to even 50%. So if you get a patient presenting with splenic sequestration, involve the surgeons because you may want to remove that spleen.
Remember, children have an increased susceptibility to encapsulated organisms such as Haemophilus influenza, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Neisseria meningitidis, Salmonella. So therefore, you must give vaccines for these things when you have a splenectomy uh, being done. And remember, they are also at risk of common infections such as Salmonella, Mycoplasma pneumoniae, Staphylococcus aureus, and even Escherichia coli. Then we'll move now to a plastic crisis. So this is going to be commonly due to an infection with erythrovirus B19, which was previously called parvovirus B19. That's going to be invading the proliferating erythroid progenitor cells. There's going to be a rapid fall in the hemoglobin with no reticulocytes that are going to be seen in the peripheral blood smear because you have this failure of the erythropoiesis in the bone marrow. These erythrovirus is going to be affecting the erythroid progenitor cells. So these patients are going to be presenting with pala, they're going to be presenting with fatigue, they're going to be presenting with tachycardia. In some cases, they may present with congestive heart failure, which is due to severe anemia. Usually only supportive care is needed and you may need to transfuse them with packed cells as you await for the virus to actually be cleared out of the body. And you may have a hyperhemolytic crisis. So here you have this rapid hemolysis and this rapid breakdown. Remember, in sickle cell patients, they may have this chronic hemolysis that may be happening over months, which may present them or it may lead them to come in with this tinge of jaundice. So most of them may have a tinge of jaundice that they may have had for some time. But this is different. The hyperhemolytic is you now have a sudden rapid hemolysis and sudden rapid breakdown of these red blood cells. So often this occurs in the patients with other hemolytic diseases like glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, and they may present with pala, fatigue, tachycardia, and jaundice. Remember that jaundice also results from the turnover of red blood cells. Like I said, because their lifespan is shortened for about 10 to 20 days. So usually, again, only supportive care and occasionally packed red blood cell transfusion is actually needed. One important thing that I want to mention about the hyperhemolytic crisis is what is known as the hyperhemolytic uh, paradigm. So this hyperhemolytic paradigm, remember that already people of African descent uh, have low levels of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is also referred to as the endothelial derived relaxation factor. So what happens is that when you break down a red blood cell, it releases hemoglobin into the bloodstream. Hemoglobin is a toxic thing. It shouldn't be allowed to roam freely into the bloodstream. So the hemoglobin that is free and not bound to anything in the bloodstream generally tends to consume the nitric oxide. So this is going to be worsening the state of deficiency of the nitric oxide, and this is going to be further causing a dysfunction in the endothelium and this may actually result in pulmonary hypertension so don't forget this due to the hyperhemolytic paradigm so how do you make a diagnosis of sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia so remember this is going to be requiring a thorough history and remember what is very important is to recognize the recurrence of the symptoms usually it's the pain the joint pains the back aches, abdominal pains and recognition of specific processes like an acute chest syndrome a cholecystitis the splenic sequestration and a priapism you want to do a full examination, noting any neurological changes. In your general examination, there may be fuzziness, irritability, poor feeding. You may have jaundice, which is icterus. You may have pala. You may sometimes have maxillary hyperplasia. Because remember, you're breaking down a lot of red blood cells, and the body is making a lot of red blood cells at the same time. So this may lead to this compensatory hyperplasia that is happening in the bone marrow, such that these bones begin to grow. So you have the growth in the maxilla. Uh, then you may also have this in the forehead, which is known as a frontal bossing. You also want to check your vital signs. You want to do a neurological examination. You also want to check the cardiac uh, examination to note any murmurs. You also want to check the respiratory system if there's any asymmetry of the breath sounds. You assess the abdomen for the spleen. You also check for any Murphy sign for presence of cholecystitis. You also check for the genitourinary system for any priapism that may be present. Then you want to also examine the extremities for any edema, ulcers, or any inflammation that may be there. And investigations are very important in sickle cell patients. So what investigations are we going to do? So our gold standard diagnostic investigation is, of course, our HB electrophoresis. Remember that this is going to help you distinguish between the homo homozygous and the heterozygous states. It's going to give you the percentages of the different hemoglobins that you have in the body. You can think of HB electrophoresis as a type of special type of chromatography that spreads the different types of hemoglobin based on their solubility uh, or across an electric field. So this is um, actually done to confirm the diagnosis. So this needs to be checked prior to a blood transfusion.
other blood investigations that you may want to order, you want to do a full blood count. Remember, you may have an HP ranging between 6 to 9. You may have a normocytic anemia. Remember, iron in this case is not a problem. You may want to transfuse these patients, transfuse these patients, transfuse these patients until you get the HP as high as possible. But this potentially is a problem as well for sickle cell patients because if you transfuse them with a lot of blood, you increase the viscosity of the blood. You may actually predispose them to having thrombotic events. You may predispose them to having a stroke. So you generally want to keep the HB somewhere roughly around 7 to 8 uh, grams per deciliter. If they're pregnant, you can even aim to push it around 10 because there will be some bleeding that they're going to be uh, incurring during uh, delivery. Then the hematocrit is roughly around 18 to 27%. The reticulocyte is about 5 to 15%. And the white blood cell count may sometimes be elevated, about 12 to 20,000 cells. This is very important. Why is this important? You need to understand how the hemo hemogram actually works. So in the hemogram, everything that passes with the nucleus is often counted as a uh, white blood cell. So often you may get these patients that are sickle cell patients that have a high white blood cell count. It doesn't mean that they have an infection. Of course, they may have an infection, but generally it's not a surprising thing to find a sickle cell patients with a high white blood cell count because of the reticulocytosis that is there and those reticulocytes being counted as white blood cells. Then you may have platelet count that is often increased greater than 500,000 platelets per microliter and you have an increase in the RDW. Remember the normal range is about 11 to 15 percent. So I usually like to explain RDW like this. Remember if you are in your class and you take the heights of individuals in your particular class, you may have individuals that are very short, you may have individuals that are very tall, and the bulk majority of them will be moderately uh, moderate height or the usual height. So if you draw a curve, it will be shaped like a bell, the normal distribution curve. So same thing in the red blood cells. You have the red blood cells that are very small, you have the red blood cells that are very huge, and the majority of them are going to be of uh, an average size. So in this case, there's a wide variation in the sizes of the red blood cells. You have a lot that are very small, a lot that are very big, and very few that are in the average age. So you tend to spread out that graph. You tend to increase the width of that graph. So this tends to increase the red cell distribution width, or the RDW. Then in terms of the peripheral smear, you may see sequel cell red blood cells, you may see target cells, you may see poikilocytes and Howell jolly bodies. I just want to explain on the Howell jolly bodies because this is what may be new to you guys. So the Howell jolly bodies are going to be, if you see this in a peripheral smear, it means that functionally this person doesn't have a spleen, they are asplenic. So they are these basophilic nuclear remnants, these clusters of DNA that you may find in the circulating erythrocytes during maturation in the bone marrow and in the late erythroblast that they normally expel their nuclei, but in some cases, the, the small portion of the DNA remains inside the cytoplasm. And in terms of the target cells, these are abnormal forms of red blood cells that are going to be appearing with this dark ring that's surrounded by a, a dark central spot, uh, and these are also referred to as codocytes. Here's a picture of the sequel-shaped red blood cells. And here's a picture of a Howell Jolly body. In the middle, you see this uh, bluish uh, cytoplasmic um, remnants of the genetic material. This is also another Howell Jolly body. This is a Howell Jolly bodies. And here are codocytes or target cells. This is a very characteristic image that actually shows up as a peripheral smear on some of your exams. As you can see, there are many things that you can see. You can see poikilocytosis. Here, this, uh, you can see this... Uh, sickle cell shaped red blood cells you can see the codocytes to some extent you may even see some how jolly bodies here's a how jolly body here's another how jolly body and that's sorry about that that's what you see you may even see these red blood cells that look like as if they are about to be fragmented they look crenated to some extent then other investigations that you may order are going to be including liver function tests. You may order urea and electrolytes. You may order a hemoglobin solubility test. Here, I want to actually distinguish between a solubility test, a hemoglobin solubility test, and a cycling test. Remember that when you do a hemoglobin solubility test, this is when you're going to be uh, checking the or exposing the sickle cell hemoglobin to a deoxygenating substance. It may be something like sodium metabisulfite, which will cause it to clump together and form these sickle shaped red blood cells. And remember that these sickle shaped red blood cells are going to be more rigid and less flexible than the normal red blood cells, and this can cause a number of complications in patients that have sickle cell like anemia, pain crises, and even organ damage. Then, in terms of a cycling test, 
If the diagnosis is actually not made, this can be established by the presence of sequel hemoglobin, then this one is a microscopic examination. So here you have this microscopic examination of this blood sample after you've exposed it to a deoxygenating solution. And if the sequel hemoglobin is actually present, you will see the sequel uh, cells forming and the characteristic crescent-shaped and um, elongated cells that are going to be there. This is actually a more specific test than the solubility test, and it's more time-consuming and more labor-intensive than the solubility test. In the next slide, I will explain the differences and go into detail about the hemoglobin solubility test. So hang in there if you still do not understand this. You may also order a blood culture if this patient is febrile. You may do arterial blood gases as well. Now here's the difference between a hemoglobin solubility test and a sickling test. Remember, hemoglobin solubility test is going to be measuring how well the hemoglobin dissolves in a solution. It's meant to deal with color changes when you add certain solutions to that deoxygenating substances. While the sickling test is going to be examining the shape of the red blood cells under a microscope. The solubility test is less specific. The sickling test is more specific. The solubility test is more sensitive. The sickling test is less sensitive, which is why even if you have a negative sickling test and you still have a high index of suspicion that this may be sequasol, then you should order an HB electrophoresis to confirm. The solubility test is quicker, while the sickling test is slower. The hemoglobin solubility test is less labor intensive, while the sickling test is more labor intensive. Now, what is this hemoglobin solubility test? So remember that the deoxygenating solution that's going to be used in the hemoglobin solubility test is typically going to be a phosphate buffer that consists of a reducing agent. So the phosphate buffer is going to be stabilizing the pH environment, while this reducing buffer is going to be removing the oxygen from the solution by conver uh, converting the hemoglobin to deoxygenated form, which is known as the deoxyhemoglobin. So remember that this deoxygenated process is very critical and crucial to the test because you're creating a hypoxic environment in this solution, kind of like how it is in the body when the hemoglobin reaches the tissues. So it's very crucial for it to actually work effectively. So the deoxyhemoglobin is actually less soluble than the oxygenated hemoglobin, and this can make it actually sickle up much easier. The phosphate buffer is going to be maintaining the pH stable at around 6.8 to 7.2. And remember that this is the optimal pH range for hemoglobin solubility. So a stable pH is going to ensure that you have this consistent results and it prevents the denaturing of the hemoglobin due to the changes in the pH. When In terms of the reducing agent that is added to the solution, remember that this agent is going to be removing this oxygen from the solution by donating electrolytes to the oxygen such that you convert it into water. Then the common reducing agents that you should have in mind are things like sodium uh, dithionite and this is going to be a very strong reducing agent that is effective at removing oxygen but it can also degrade over time so fresh solutions are actually recommended. A commonly used one is sodium metabisulfite which is a weaker reducing agent compared to the sodium dithionite but it is actually more stable and less prone to degradation. Then you also have the sodium uh, borohydride which is a very strong reducing agent that can uh, also generate hydrogen gas. It requires careful handling because and ventilation because hydrogen is actually quite explosive. Then the specific concentration of these reducing agents that are used depend on the different protocols that different labs have, but typically it ranges from 1 to 2% for sodium dithionite or 2 to 5% for sodium metabisulfite. So in summary, you get this deoxygenating solution in a hemoglobin solubility test that's going to be consisting of a phosphate buffer and a reducing agent. So you're going to be creating this deoxygenated environment where you have this deoxyhemoglobin that uh, its solubility can actually be assessed by uh, doing this. We can actually screen for sickle cell disease. Here is a picture of the different labs and the expected findings that you may see in terms of a full blood count, a peripheral smear, liver function test, urea and electrolytes, iron studies and other investigations you may want to order. You may pause the video and actually look at this table. It's pretty self-explanatory. Now, in terms of imaging, you may have to get a chest x-ray if you're suspecting this is an acute chest syndrome or if you want to rule out a pneumonia.
when you do a skull x-ray, you get a very characteristic finding that you may see on your exams. So you may get what is known as a hair on end appearance. So this is because, like I said, this compensatory hyperplasia that you get. So the is this marrow hyperplasia that's going to be due to this chronic hemolysis. So there is this... Um, accentuation of the trabeculae between the bones. So the vertical trabeculae that are found in between the inner tables and the outer tables of the diploid bones, like the skull bones, can actually become hypertrophied or accentuated. So this actually presents like hair on end appearance on the x-ray. I do add some images that I will show you in the next slides. But remember, this can also be seen on CT and it can be demonstrated in other types of hemolytic anemias and even other types of um, diseases such as thalassemias. In the MRI, you may see early bone changes. You may get a CT scan. You may get a technetium 99 scan. If you're mm -hmm. suspecting any osteonecrosis, you may want to get a transcranial Doppler ultrasound for those that are at risk of developing stroke. You want to do an abdominal ultrasound to check for any cholecystitis, cholelithiasis, or ectopic pregnancies, and to measure any splenomegaly or hepatomegaly. An echo is very important for those that have pulmonary hypertension, and you may also want to get a spirometry. Here is a picture of the hair on end appearance. Do not forget what this actually looks like. It's a very characteristic image that they actually bring for you on your OSCE exams. Now, what are some of the complications that we see in patients that have sickle cell anemia? You may divide them into different systems and like to come from head to toe so that you can easily remember. So in the central nervous system, you have cerebral infarcts. And this is the most common finding is the obstruction of the distro intracranial internal carotid artery or the proximal middle cerebral artery. So this may cause transient ischemic attacks. It may cause a stroke. It may cause cerebral hemorrhage. You may also have seizures in these patients. You may have a dimish, diminished cognition, a lower IQ. Generally, we're not seeing people that have sequel, so have generally lower IQs because we have those that have actually done a lot of things. We have a lot of people that are even doctors. Then you may also have coma in these patients. And in terms of the eyes, you may have the uh, ptosis, you may have the uh, proliferative retinopathies, you may have the retinal hemorrhages. You may also have retinal detachment, which may lead to blindness. Then when you come to the respiratory system, you may have pulmonary embolism, you may have fat embolism, you may sometimes have respiratory distress as a feature, you may have respiratory failure, which may also kill the patient, and then you may have the pulmonary hypertension. Remember what I told you about the hyperhemolytic paradigm. In terms of the cardiovascular system, you may have a cardiomegaly, you may have arrhythmias, you may have a dilatation of the both ventricles as well as the left atrium, you may have hemochromatosis and iron overload cardiomyopathies, especially if you continue giving these people a lot of iron, because remember, iron is not really the problem. So with recurrent transfusions in these patients, one of the complications is actually hemochromatosis, where you get this iron deposits in various tissues and you may get this iron overload cardiomyopathy. You may sometimes get myocardial infarctions. You may get congestive heart failure. You may also sometimes get copulmonale, which is a right-sided heart failure caused uh, by pulmonary pathologies. In this case, the pulmonary pathology is the pulmonary hypertension based on the hyperhemolytic paradigm. Then in terms of the gastrointestinal system, you may get a cholelithiasis where you get these pigment stones or gallstones that are occurring because of the chronic hemolysis. You may get this chronic hepatomegaly. You may get this liver dysfunction. You may get an acute abdomen because of the mesenteric artery blockage. You may get an autosplenectomy. Then in terms of the genitourinary system, you may get a chronic uh, tubular interstitial nephritis. You may get isostenuria where the kidneys lose their concentration capacity. You may get priapism, which we talked about earlier on. You may have impotence. And in the gynecological history, in terms of female patients, they may get menstrual irregularities. They may get spontaneous abortions if they do get pregnant, which may impair the placental blood flow. You may get intrauterine growth restriction or retardation. You may get preeclampsia as a complication for the pregnant women. You may get intrauterine fetal death. In the dermatological system, patients tend to present with leg ulcers, which are common in the medial and the lateral malleoli, and you may get this poor wound healing. In terms of the musculoskeletal system, remember the growth and developmental delay is very common in these patients. Young children are going to be short, but they may regain their height by adulthood. 
However, they may remain uh, of a normal weight. There is often a delay in the sexual maturation. There may be a delayed puberty, which may require some hormonal therapy. In terms of the bones, you may get a vascular necrosis of the head of the femur. You may get compression of the vertebra. You may get shortening of the bones of the hands and the feet. You may get osteomyelitis. But remember, this is commonly due to Staphylococcus aureus. And, but the most common or most important one that you must look for is salmonella. Staphylococcus aureus generally causes osteomyelitis worldwide. It's one of the most important causes. Here's a picture to just summarize all the complications and the important ones that I want you to actually keep in mind. You may pause the video, take a screenshot to help you remember. Then how do we manage these patients, in, especially those that come in with crisis, especially with the acute chest syndrome? So you want to admit these patients. You generally want to add, uh, give them adequate hydration. The assumption we make is that patients that come in with sickle cell have severe dehydration. So we give them 1.5 times the maintenance. I actually did a video on maintenance and fluid calculations that I will leave tagged at the end of the video. You also want to offer them pain management, analgesia. You may give them NSAIDs, help get them out of the crisis like diclofenac or naproxen. You may want to give them some oxygen support, ventilation. Sometimes CPAP may be necessary. You may also want to cover them on antibiotics. Remember, if you're suspecting an acute chest syndrome, cover the, on the atypical organisms. Like for the mycoplasma and chlamydia, you may use cefiroxim and azithromycin. Then you may also want to perform an incentive spirometry and bronchodilators may sometimes be used in, in cases of acute chest syndrome. Steroids are also have been implicated in some protocols, but we don't routinely use them in our setup here. And there's early use of partial exchange transfusion, which is done in some centers in a patient who's not responding to the initial therapy. So management of the other crisis, for those that are presenting with respiratory distress, cover them with antibiotics, give them supplemental oxygen. They may need a partial exchange transfusion. For those with splenic sequestration, we want to replete the intravascular volume. If they have severe anemia, you want to transfuse them with blood. For those with priapism, give them analgesia, hydrate them, and you may offer a partial exchange transfusion. Remember transfusion, you want to give them packed cells. We don't want to give them whole blood because there's a risk of them tipping them into heart failure. But you want to give them 15 to 20 mils per kg, a body weight of packed cells. For those that have sudden severe anemia, which may be due to acute splenic sequestration, for those with a plastic crisis, or for those with hyperhemolytic crisis. Then in terms of ALF patients, you generally want to review the FPC regularly. Remember, target HP is roughly around 7 to 8. If they're pregnant, you may even push them a bit higher. And remember, you don't want to push them too high because there's a risk of making their blood viscous. There's a risk of increasing thrombotic events. You want to cover them with prophylaxis with penicillins, 500 uh, milligrams um, daily, and vaccinate them with the polyvalent pneumococcal and meningococcal and hemophilus influenza type of B vaccine. Give them some folic acid, express for patients with hemolysis. Remember, we don't give them ferrous sulfate because iron is not the problem. So you give it at a rate of one milligram per day. Then in terms of hydroxyurea, there is some criteria for patients that actually do want to start on hydroxyurea. So when I was actually making this PowerPoint slide, it was a bit way back. I did a video on hydroxyurea. So I will leave it also tagged at the end of this uh, lecture that you can actually check out and watch after this to see how hydroxyurea is actually used. But generally, it can be given for patients that have sickle cell disease with, for example, a cerebrovascular accident. Remember, hydroxyurea is going to be increasing the hemoglobin F, but it may also have this carcinogenic effect. It may cause secondary leukemias. And aside this, the hemoglobin F has a high affinity for oxygen, so it may decrease the oxygen tissue delivery. So it may cause tissue hypoxia. It usually starts at 15 milligrams per kg per day. You can increase by 2.5 milligrams over 12 weeks, depending on the response. You may sometimes consider a bone marrow transplant for severe cases. And remember, bone marrow transplant is the only cure, but you have to have this patient's meeting and eligibility criteria. The median life expectancy of this patient is roughly around the mid-40s. I really hope you enjoyed this video on sickle cell anemia and sickle cell disease if you did consider subscribing to the channel hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time i post to zambia and beyond my name is dr moses kazevu until next time bye bye